everyone, welcome. And thank you for being here today. My name is Mariah Bestplug, and I recently completed my Master of Arts at the University of Lethbridge. Today I'm going to be sharing with you some elements of my project, which was called Building a Refuge, Narratives from the Private Sponsorship of Refugees Program in the Lethbridge Area. Um, and so normally when I present this research, it's, it's to more of an academic audience, and I talk about like the research findings and the methodology and the objectives, but today is different. Um, my goal today is more to just share the stories of the groups that I was able to interview. So I interviewed seven different groups from the Lethbridge area, mostly within Lethbridge, um, both sponsors and refugees. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about their stories um, that I've learned over the past two years. Um, just a warning ahead of time, I can't possibly share all of the stories because there were so many. So I apologize for ahead of time for everything that inevitably has been left out of this presentation. Hopefully you can think of it more as just the start of a conversation. Before I dive into things, I also want to acknowledge the contributions of the 25 individuals who I interviewed for this project. Their courage, trust, and thoughtfulness and generosity made the research possible. And to those of you who are in the audience today, thank you. And thank you for being here today. Um, and also just a quick thank you to my supervisor, Dr. Julie Young, and my committee members, Dr. Tom Johnston and Dr. Carly Adams for their support. So the title of this project is Building Refuge, and it's been framed around this idea that for different people, building refuge looks and feels very different, and it changes over time. It's impacted by where somebody is located, both where they come from and where they resettle to. And so before I get into the stories, I'm going to give a little bit of information about the private sponsorship of refugees program. The PSR program is one of three ways that refugees can be resettled in Canada. The other two being government assistantships and a blended program. So what makes private sponsorship different from government assisted refugee resettlements is that groups of Canadians, often organizations like churches um, and community groups, support a refugee or a refugee family financially and emotionally for the first 12 months in Canada. One thing that's also important to note is that refugees who arrive through this program are additional or above and beyond any refugees that would be brought in by the government. Um, so those who choose to sponsor usually pay for things like rent, utilities, general living expenses for that first year. They supply clothing, furniture, household goods. They find interpreters, um, a family doctor and a dentist. They assist with gaining provincial health care coverage. They assist in enrolling adults in language school and children in regular schools. Um, they introduce them to community members, provide orientation in the community, and help with seeking employment. And really, uh, um, there's a lot more above and beyond that they do. Um, and each group is different as well. So that's important to remember. That's OK. Private or community sponsorship in Canada became official in the Immigration Act of 1976, which came into effect in 1978. Um, in practice, Canadians have resettled 370,000 refugees through this program since it officially began, um, and over 610 to Lethbridge. My research in particular looked at two of the most well-known refugee movements in Canada, those from Southeast Asia in the late 1970s and early 1980s, and more recently Syrian refugees, so from around 2015 to really up until today. However, unofficial sponsorship of refugees has a lot longer history in Canada. So for example, Canadian Mennonite communities helped resettle 21,000 Mennonite refugees from the Soviet Union between 1923 and 1930. And similarly, the Jewish Immigration Aid Service of Canada and Benai Brith supported the resettlement of Jewish people exiting Soviet Russia without cost to the Canadian government. The roots of the program as we see it today date back most specifically to the 1940s when religious groups began, began advocating for community-sponsored resettlement options. So when the official program came into effect in 1978, it lacked specificity in how it would be enacted. And so one group that really stepped up um, and made some movements here was the Mennonite community, and in particular MCC, which is the Mennonite Central Committee. And they worked with the government to create a policy framework to implement sponsorship on a larger scale. And so the result of that was that they created what they called master agreements. Um, and the Mennonite Central Committee became the first master agreement holder. But that same year, the government signed 40 agreements. 
And all of them were with religious um, institutions, so churches, dioceses, things like that. And so, now that you have a brief overview of what private sponsorship is, I want to talk about the different groups that I interviewed. So, let's step back in our imaginations to Lethbridge around the time of 1979. So, this photo here has nothing to do with sponsorship, but hopefully it can cue us to um, step back to that time. <laughs> Think about what, what Lethbridge was like at that time. So of the participants I interviewed, there were two groups from around this time period. The first was Francis and Sybil, who were parishioners of what was then St. Patrick's Church. And at that time, Francis and Sybil had recently immigrated to Canada, um, and they were approached by their church to help a family who had, who had arrived through government sponsorship, but they thought they could use some support from communities, from the community. Um, so they asked Francis and Sybil to do that. And something that stood out about their experience is, is that to this day, they still have a very strong relationship with this family. Um, and in fact, every Christmas, the Vietnamese family delivers spring rolls to Francis and Sybil to enjoy over the holidays. Um, and I think that's quite special and um, is a real indication of that relationship. And the second group, which I'll share a little bit more detail about, was the Sterling Vietnamese Refugee Aid Organization. And it's kind of funny that they had that name because they didn't sponsor a Vietnamese family, they sponsored a Laotian family. So in 1979, these 40 master agreements were signed with religious institutions, um, and some of them were Catholic churches. So in Lethbridge at that time, there was a gentleman named Ralph Himsel and he was the superintendent of the Catholic school division. And he set up an information session where people in the community could come and learn about the program. Because remember, it was brand new and people hadn't really done this before, um, except back, you know, historically, but in a different way. Um, and so the first person that I interviewed for this project, Bev, actually attended this meeting. And so you're gonna hear what she has had to say about that. Oops.
So as Bev said, there ended up being seven families in total. And one of the others was Linda and Ian, who I also had the pleasure of inter interviewing. And one rule that Linda and Ian had in the sponsorship was hiring the parents to work on their farm when they ended up arriving in Canada. So aside from finding accommodation and work for the family, there were a number of other challenges that they faced as a group, um, including the language barrier, which many sponsors say was their biggest challenge. And so I'm gonna play one more clip from Bev where she talks um, about some of these challenges that they overcame during this time. <laughs> so one of the earliest memories for Bev of this family was of six-month-old baby Vienne being allergic to milk. But being that this sponsorship happened in 1979, Vienne is now over 40 years old. And so after chatting with Bev, I was able to get into contact with Vienne and learn about this experience from her family's perspective. And so in this next clip, you're going to hear from, from Vienne. Uh, 
the owner of the company uh, started to notice a bunch of soldiers that were um, surrounding the area that where they logged. So then he went and told my father, oh, camp, like Camp N, you need to, I think there's people coming here to capture you. You need to go back. My dad decided to leave that night and go back to my mom to get her to get out of the country. And as he was leaving, he actually got captured by them and sent off to a camp that was a a re-education camp. He had said to one of our sponsors that it was actually a camp that you would actually work until you die. He actually escaped out of that, made it back to my mom, and then they had this plan to escape over to Thailand. Because my dad was working at the army, he had enough money and they collected money from other family members that wanted to escape as well. They bought two canoe-sized boats. They are big enough to fit probably four or five adults and a handful of kids as well. As they were about to cross the river, my dad's older brother mentioned to him, oh no, please don't go, I have a boat. He was a part of the army as well. I have a boat that's, you know, getting ready to take a bunch of us, you know, people over to Thailand. My dad was, oh no, we already got, we're set up, we're ready to go. So they went down by the Mekong River, and as they were leaving, my mom had said that the boat was full, it was tippy, had lots of people's belongings and stuff in there. When they were going, there must have been some kind of sound or something. There was the soldiers that were patrolling the river heard the noise and they started shooting just out in the water and that's when the boat tipped over. My sister died of drowning and my dad also lost a nephew who was probably shot in a gunfire. He told my mom, he's like, we need to get out of here because the next time they capture me, I'll get get shot for sure Mm -hmm. this time. They had to retreat, go back to Laos again. So after this, Vien's parents did end up making it to Thailand by crossing the Mekong River separately, and they ended up heading to the Nong Khai refugee camp in Thailand. So while Linda, Ian, Bev, and other members of their group were hearing about Southeast Asian refugees in the news, Vien's family was doing what they could to escape from Laos. When they arrived in Sterling, the families met, Vien's father worked on the farms, and after their first year of sponsorship, they moved into Lethbridge where they could get different jobs and be closer to other Laotian families. If you remember back to the beginning of the presentation, I talked about how the title, Building Refuge, is meant to capture how people find and create space in different ways. So I want to share one more excerpt from Vien that I think really highlights that. I feel like that's one of those um, stories that you can that really resonates with a lot of different people that arrive in Canada from all kinds of places. That getting back to their old selves and having those those parties and making food for an army. Um, I just love that. So I'm not going to share any more details about this group, but I will ask that you bear with me as we do a bit of time travel to the next period that I'm going to talk about today, which is around 2015. So. As I said earlier, the second period I focused on was the arrival of Syrian refugees. Um, And really the place where this story begins is in 2015, around the time of the federal, Canada's federal election. So that was at the time when Justin Trudeau made the campaign promise to bring in 25,000 Syrian refugees. And following his election win, we saw a lot of photos like the one on the left. Um, And in addition to photos like this of Trudeau greeting refugees at the airport and the buzz about refugees around the election, 
there were other types of images circulating. One that many of you may remember is the one on the right of three-year-old Syrian um, boy Alan Kurdi, whose lifeless body washed up on Turkish shores in September of 2015. And in my interview with participants for this project, a number of them um, talked about this photo as being sort of a catalyst for people in the community wanting to help support Syrian refugees. And so these were the groups that I was able to talk to from this time period. The first one I want to tell you a little bit about is the World University Service of Canada, or WUSC. In the fall of 2015, a group of University of Lethbridge students started a local chapter of WUSC, and their goal was to participate in the Student Refugee Program, the SRP program. Um, and that's a national program that resettles student refugees to Canada, giving them both permanent residency and a scholarship to the university. During the 2015-2016 school year, which was the first year the group existed, they fundraised and received donations to sponsor their first student. However, um, they knew that this wasn't necessarily going to be sustainable every year. So they decided to do a campaign where every University of Lethbridge student would pay $2 per semester as part of their fees that would go to the student refugee program. And so they had to hold a student union referendum to make this pass. Um, and they did end up passing it. Um, and so since then, the WUS group has been able to sponsor a student um, every year. And they actually just welcomed a new student within like the last week. So, that, so that's quite exciting um, and amazing of them. Another group was St. Martha's Parish that got involved with sponsorship a little bit later, closer to 2018. Um, something notable about this group was that they were able to secure assistance for dental care, which can be a big challenge for refugees that arrive in Canada, but they had a member of their church who was a dentist and was able to offer them care that they wouldn't have otherwise had. There was another group from All Saints Parish, and they have a really dedicated committee that's worked to sponsor two families to Lethbridge, and they're waiting for a third. An interesting um, part about this group is that they used what they called a surrogate family model. So um, a family in the church would take on a really strong social role um, and kind of act like grandparents and really include the family in all of their celebrations and holidays. And that worked really well for them. That's something sort of different that they did. And so these last two groups, I'm going to share a little bit more details about. Um, first, because they're really large collaborations um, that settled extended families. And secondly, the two groups were really well connected to each other, and their beginnings start in similar places. So I'm going to start with Ryan, who is the pastor of Lethbridge Mennonite Church, and he emerged as sort of the leader for the ecumenical social action group. So Lethbridge Mennonite Church, Coaldale United, MacKillop United, and various community members were a part of that. And I'll play you a clip from Ryan.
you remember back to the story that I shared about Bev, Linda, Ian, and Vien from 1979, you hopefully remember that what started it all was a community meeting organized by Ralph Himsel, the superintendent at the time. And so it's interesting that almost 40 years later, another community meeting, this time led by Ryan and the Mennonite Church, would be the start. And so as Ryan said, he had contacted a number of other clergy in the community, and one of those was Aaron, who is an Anglican priest and also the campus chaplain for the university. So a whole bunch of things sort of happened. Lethbridge Mennonite and McKillop United started a project in the spring of 2015. And McKillop is one of my sponsoring congregations, so I knew lots about it from friends there. And the pastor at Lethbridge Mennonite, Ryan Duix, a friend of mine, so I knew about it from him as well. So we started talking about it in Coldale at the church about how we'd like to support this. And at that point, it was just sort of a, oh, we should look at maybe doing some fundraising to help them. I mean, it was pretty sort of loosey-goosey at that point. And then Alan Curry dropped. And that was just pretty devastating. You know, those pictures... And then that Sunday, I, I was doing two Sundays a month out in Tabor. And that Sunday, I talked about those pictures in my sermon. And when I finished my sermon, I get so choked up when I think about this. So one of the women who's like one of the pillars of the church just jumped out of her seat. And she said, excuse me, please forgive me. She turned to the congregation and said, you know, people feel bad for us because we don't have a regular minister. I don't feel bad for us. We can do this. This is something we can do because we have the money. Let's do this. I think God is calling us to do this. Please speak to me after the service, but I think this is what God wants us to do. Apologize and sat down, and I was just like, ah, uh, preach it. So that would have been the first Sunday in September. And the following week, I was in Coldale. The following week, they had a congregational meeting, so I had nothing to do with this. They voted unanimously to support sponsorship. So that was the beginning of September. The Mennonite Church had a meeting with and the principal person for MCC doing sponsorship, an educational evening so we could find out what was involved. And so I was there and some other people from the Anglican churches and I was there from the university. And there was a surgeon there who said he had a group of doctors, basically the general surgeons from the hospital who were also interested and then there were other people from other churches there was it was a pretty full room as i remember and so sort of took us through what was involved financially personally in terms of support you know difficulties potential difficulties you know, we didn't want to make this sound like it was all lovey-dovey you know we said like it's often difficult and you're doing it because it's the right thing to do it so at that point we had Three Anglican churches, Tabor, Coldale, and Lethbridge. And the university was sort of gathering steam. So at this point, it's the fall of 2015, and two large groups have formed, Ryan's group and Aaron's group, the Lethbridge Resettlement Collaboration. So what I want to do next is tell you what happened with each of these three groups as time went on. And I'll start with Ryan's group. So I had the pleasure of interviewing Ryan, April, Lee, and Barb. Um, once they decided they wanted to do this sponsorship, they needed to find a refugee family to sponsor. And there's two ways that that can be done. The first way is what's called a visa office referred refugee. So sort of chosen by the UNHCR, put on a list, and you can you get sort of matched with them. Or you can name someone from a personal connection. And so you're going to hear first from Lee and then from Ryan about how this happened um, for this group. And the MCC, who had been actually approached by a Syrian Orthodox priest, that he had this family that he really wanted to, to go to Canada, and could we do it? So I think, you know, it just was sort of serendipity that we wanted to do it, and they had some of them wanted to come. And then we were sort of anticipating just you know, waiting for the 
Um, another interesting element of Ryan's group was that they had quite a large social media presence. Their page called From Syria to Lethbridge. Um, and one of the reasons that this came about was because of the work of April, who's a visual artist who joined their group and actually designed this poster and logo and managed their Facebook page during this time. And I asked April how the design came about and I wanted to share her response because I think it really um, highlights what this group was trying to do during this time. I remember being up and not being able to sleep at night because I was thinking about the imagery. I think first the From Syria to Lethbridge came about. That phrase came about because it just it didn't have the word refugee or crisis or immigration in it. It was just based on moving people from one place to another place. And it was always a sort of a movement based on sort of like hope and love. I remember like wanting to incorporate sort of like the giving. And so there's, there's these figures that are based on sort of Henry Matisse's cutouts, obviously based on those and just giving hearts, having your own hearts, like, and they were not specific. They were all sorts of arbitrary colors. So it wasn't about sort of one specific group requiring help from another specific group so much as just people helping people mm -hmm. and sort of bringing our, out our common humanity instead of different sort of nationalities and, and skin colors and political lines. Mm -hmm. And so the group began by sponsoring two families, which was two brothers, their wives and children and their mother. Later, they found out that there were also two sisters still in Syria, and they ended up sponsoring those families as well. So when the families arrived, obviously there were challenges, there were opportunities, and many different experiences. One of the biggest things I learned in this project was that no two refugees are the same, and so everyone's going to have a very different experience. And so I just want to share one experience from, um, from this group that I found quite, quite touching from uh, Lee. I just can relate to that. Oh man, how are we gonna? How am I gonna tell them about putting the dollar in the cart? <laughs> I think that's just awesome. Okay, so I want to talk now about the the last group a little bit, the Lethbridge Resettlement Collaboration, or Aaron's group from before. And what's quite interesting is the connection that they had to Ryan's group, and also with other refugee support agencies in the community. So remember, April and Ryan were managing a pretty large social media presence at this time, and so on October first they got a very important message from a community member named Muna. Muna had immigrated to Canada in 2009, and in 2011, when the war broke out in Syria, she did what she could to bring her family to Canada. And I'm actually going to read what Muna had to say. So I decided that since the war started to find an organization or someone to help me, but I couldn't. I called different organizations, some were in BC, some were in Quebec, Ontario, lots of places, and I couldn't find anyone like even no answer. I sent emails, I sent voicemail messages, and like lots of ways, but nobody picked the phone up or replied to my emails, so I quit. And then I found Ryan on Facebook. 
I was on Facebook and then I found a page and it was called From Syria to Lethbridge. And right away, without thinking, I sent a messenger to this page and I talked about my need. I need to bring my family to Canada, help them to come here. They live in a bad situation. And one of my brothers was about to cross the Mediterranean illegally to Europe. You know, the famous dangerous way. So like, I went to the kitchen to do something. I forgot all about it because I didn't think that anyone would help me with this. And then like three hours later, I went to my cell phone and I found a message from, from Syria to Lethbridge from this page. And it was Ryan and he told me, I don't know how to work on that. I don't know the process for that, but I'll try to do something. And later on asked me, can we meet? And I said, of course, yes. And we met at the college and he brought Aaron with him. And that's how I met them. And now you're gonna hear what Aaron's, Aaron remembers from this. And Ryan phoned me uh, October 1st, 2015. He phoned me, he said, I just got, uh, I think it was a Facebook message, maybe an email, from a student at the college, Syrian, Syrian Canadian, who has family who are refugees. And she wants my help. We already have our project, but maybe you'd like to meet her. Like they already have their family. So I said, yeah, that'd be great. So, you know, could we meet that day? Well, yes. She said, where, when, you know, she'd be there. So Ryan and I met with Muna and she had her boys with her. And we met at the college, sat and had coffee. And she told us her story and the story of her family. And, and I just said, well, I can't make any promises, but I'll take it back to the group. And, and then we parted and I turned around and said, okay, so we have to help. He's like, yeah, but I mean, you can't promise, right? Mm -hmm. But she was so lovely, and you know, those stories just get to you, right? Anyway, and it seemed ideal because it was a name, you know, it was an A sponsorship, mm -hmm. so we didn't have to wait for the government to do anything. The, the problem was it was a big family. So, I mean, not big by Syrian fat standards, I've since discovered, but big by Canadian <laughs> standards. So she had her parents and three siblings and their family. So we talked about it and like I took it back to my various groups and I said, like, this is too big for any one of our groups to do, but if we all work together, we could do this. And so that started what ended up being a multi-year journey um, to sponsor this extended family to Canada. And beyond bringing in this family to Canada, this same group also did a lot of work in the community to support government-assisted refugees as well. Um, so I'm gonna start with one clip from Aaron, um, but it's talking about a gentleman named Mike, um, and you'll hear from him afterwards as well. And, and Mike took his truck, and he just started collecting furniture, and clothing, and dishes, and towels, and sheets, and you know, lamps, all the things that you need. Mm -hmm. And then the university gave us constant as well. So we're just collecting and collecting and collecting. It was kind of insane. So we we realized like we had way more than we needed. Even even with four families, we had more than we needed. So we went to immigrant services and said, look, you're gonna have all these daughters coming. Let us support them with stuff too. Mm -hmm. Because the government gives them the basic stuff, but not a lot of this other stuff. So as Aaron said, Mike played a really big role in collecting and delivering furniture to government assisted refugees as well. Um, and Mike came to be known in the community as Uncle Mike. Um, and so I got to interview Uncle Mike and his wife Barb who were both involved with this. And here's, here's Mike talking. When we were working with the, the sponsored families, I, I got very involved in, in asking for and collecting donations furniture and uh, it, it almost became overwhelming. I had a, a good sized uh, carpentry block my son-in-law that I used and, and we ended up with the story to uh, at least three different places. But anyways, then the big last British ship was in group and what was after them. Um, and the service we, we were working with them a fair bit and they, they 
English was, was starting to get pretty good. And I, I met them at the, the school. And anyways, I, I got a note to deliver some furniture to them. So we, we went to their place. We went up and, and knocked on the door. And, and the, the boy wouldn't open the door. But I talked to him in Arabic through the door. And all, he said he didn't know him. His dad wasn't home. He wouldn't open the door. Finally, I realized who it was behind the door. I said, "This is Mike," and he opened the door. Oh, hi, Mike! <laughs> and more, more of a sandwich. And I still tease about it. I said, "You couldn't get him to open the door." In Arabic, but in my three words of English, I got it. <laughs> they that family are probably our closest. Yeah. Association. They they live they 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 moved to a house a block and a half from our place and they were there for about a year, year and a half. So we visited back and forth a lot. All right, so I'm almost at my last clip. Um, and so lastly I want to share one story that a participant named Lorraine shared with me who is part of Aaron's group. And I found this story interesting because it showed how these groups are really connected to the larger community. Um, it's not just the refugees and the sponsors who are involved, um, but they really spread to other people, their friends and their family in the community. Um, and so I'm going to play Lorraine's clip. So what an awesome memory and, and just one example of how um, these sponsorships are so much broader than just the refugees who arrive and the sponsors who are involved. It really attracts lots of people in the community who get involved. So on that note, unfortunately, I've come to the end of my time. Um, but I just want to reiterate again, there were so many stories that I heard um, over the last two years for this project. And this is really just a small taste of them. So if you're interested in hearing more of the stories, they are going to be um, held in the University of Lethbridge's digital collection. And that should come available later in the fall. So thank you.